are we live? We must be pretty close. Okay, thank you, Steve. And a good afternoon to everyone at the GQRP Club Convention and many others listening on YouTube. I'm Peter VK3YE, and for the next 40 minutes or so, I'll talk about a few topics, QRP in Australia, uh, a bit on magnetic loops, a um, bit on home brewing. But before all of that, I um, first of all wish to um, pay tribute to George Dobbs, the late George Dobbs, G3RJV, whose books were amongst those who got me and others into amateur radio and electronics. This was even, I think, before George formed the GQRP Club. Simple electronics, building component, building little projects with bits of board and screws and you would drill holes in the board and you would tighten the screws and put the component leads under the screw cups, but you wouldn't tighten them too tight, otherwise you might damage the component leads. Nevertheless, it was a very easy way for young people like me to get into electronics and radio and to start building things and so a lot of my first projects were built this way and i think um uh, george dobbs has a lot to do with that so um um uh, uh george's passing was certainly uh felt here in australia um and all around the world um first of all um um talk a little briefly about the QRP scene in Australia. Um, you'll be able to ask questions later on. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, uh, we've got the GQRP club equivalent in Australia is the CW operators QRP club, though we also uh, support all modes of QRP, um, VK QRP club. Um, have a look at their website. And I would also particularly encourage you to look at some of their back issues of Low Key Magazine, um, which is also available now. So that's the uh, VK QRP Club, uh, founded in 1983. They've got, I think, about 250 to 300 members. Um, so they put out a magazine each quarter, every now and then, QRP contests, and uh, they get uh, a bit of following. Um, another um, aspects of QRP activity that's been quite popular over the last five or so years, summits of the air. Um, um, uh, we've got, although Australia is mostly flat and arid, there are enough peaks to keep people interested in that. And also locally arranged national parks. A lot of people operate QRP from national parks. It's a uh, great to operate from a park because of the low noise floor so you can hear people and especially to make two way QRP to QRP contacts. So. Uh, uh, that's quite popular, mostly on 40 metres, though some other bands as well. Um, at this phase of the solar cycle, 40 metres isn't so good for the closer in contacts. 80 metres can be surprisingly good. In fact, I had a contact today um, on 80 metres, 450 kilometres, uh, running five watts on slow scan TV, which we, we just managed to make the distance. Um, other activities as well, The um, um, there's a club called Fists Down Under, the CW uh, Operators Club. Um, the Australia New Zealand chapter has little contests every month or so on 80 metres, and they are quite popular. So um, uh, most, maybe half the stations in that are QRP. So that's the, uh, um, the main centres of QRP activity in Australia. Um, another thing that is uh, quite active here is that we're fortunate to have a couple of local kit suppliers. Um, there's many kits in South Australia that specialise in microwave equipment. Um, most of that's QRP. And we also have OzQRP based in New South Wales. Um, and they put out a number of kits. Um, I'm holding a little 80 metre double sideband transceiver. Um, it uses a ceramic resonator and it covers um, about 100 kilohertz or so of the band, about one or two watts of double sideband. Then just recently, OzQRP have brought out another double sideband rig 
called the DCT um, direct conversion transceiver. That does CW as well as double sideband, and you can get it in both 40 and 80 meter versions, and it's got a digital display. So um, there's quite a bit of QRP construction development and even kit making here in Australia. Um, so, so that has been uh, um, really, really good. Um, the, um, as far as um, um, some of the other topics for, um, for, for this afternoon, um, building and operating QRP gear. I've got with me a few pieces of um, um, QRP thing. This you might be familiar with. You, there's been quite a few videos on it. I call it the Beach 40. Um, it's a frequency agile two watt double side band transceiver. It covers the most useful part of 40 meters. It uses a ceramic resonator on 7.2 megahertz, and that can be pulled over a surprisingly large frequency range. And uh, it's very simple, and it's a direct conversion receiver. There's, there's only like six or seven transistors in it, plus the ubiquitous LM386 audio chip. So for a very simple double sideband transceiver, it's frequency agile. That's really important. I'll talk about that later on. Um, something like the Beach 40 is, is possibly worth considering. You can build the direct conversion receiver first, and then when you're happy with that, add a few extra parts for the transmitter. Uh, a lot of the stages are shared between the transmitter and the receiver. There's information on that on my website, vk3ya.com. Um, so I've had contacts up to about 3,000 kilometres um, from here in Eastern Australia across to New Zealand and also to Western Australia on this double sideband transceiver. Um, another thing, and, and it's a, uh, surprisingly small, this has been one of my other projects I built a few years ago. Um, it's based on a design by SP5AHT, a very ingenious phasing type direct conversion SSB transceiver. Yes, it is true single sideband. And again, it uses a ceramic resonator on seven megahertz. And the opposite sideband rejection isn't perfect, but it's certainly uh, um, on receive, you certainly notice it compared with a direct conversion receiver. Um, I believe that might have form, um, come from a, initially a Russian design. There are circuits of that on, on the web, but it's an incredibly ingenious circuit. Um, again, I've got a bit on, on my website that talks about phasing SSB, a lot of links. Um, but yeah, it's not something I'd recommend for the beginner. Um, the parts are quite packed in, but um, just the idea of building something that's SSB with relatively few components, um, I think that's got a lot of attraction. Um, now, this is goes back to um, one of my earlier QRP rigs, about built it probably about 20 years ago or, or more. Um, no, it's maybe near to 30 years ago. Um, it's so old, it uses a CA3028, a very simple direct conversion CW transceiver for 80 meters. In fact, I think it was a GQRP club publication that, um, or it might have been an article in Radcom that first introduced me to 3.58 megahertz ceramic resonators. And you're actually able to pull them down into the CW end of 80 meters. And um, of course, 3.58 megahertz does have a bit of an attraction for me because my first contact was on that frequency by using a crystal. Um, 3.58 megahertz there happened to be a local net on ssb that operated around that frequency and i i, I broke in and i i had cw to ssb cross mode contacts on 3.58 um the australian 80 meter band being a bit different so that was the ssb segment thing so um yeah 3.58 megahertz is an a, a frequency that has a bit of an um um historic memories for me. Now, although we're going off topic, we're going from CW to, uh, you know, spoken about double sideband. Well, I've been experimenting lately with FT8, um, not FT8, no, it's even, I reckon it's even better than FT8. JS8 Core, um, a, a wonderful mode for QRP, 
unlike FTH, which is uh, very robotic, uh, you have your rubber stamp contacts and signal reports relocated, and that's that. With JSA Call, it's free text, so you can type whatever you want. It reminds me a lot of slow speed CW. Um, it goes at about you know 10 to 15 words a minute. Um, like FTH, it's got 15 second blocks, but you can transmit as long as you like, um, and you can send free text. Anyway, um, my best contacts with that, um, there, there's a lot of benefits with JS8 call. If a station is unattended, you can put in a command where you can basically get a signal report from them. It gives you the signal to noise ratio, and you can request their station information. You can even leave personal messages for them. I think you might even be able to relay messages or, or uh, reports through other stations. Um, another thing that's interesting is that you can put in, uh, if you send a command to a station that can hear you, then you can get an idea of the other stations that that other station is hearing. And it's, it's quite interesting, the variations. Uh, sometimes you can hear people, they can't. So look it up, you can get the software for free. It's just like any computer-based program. You just need a simple interface cable or box between your computer and your transceiver. And JS8 call is definitely uh, something worth pursuing. Um, it, and, and I find the programs very easy to use. Um, as far as QRP with it, um, I hadn't, uh, I've got an attenuator box. I use my FT817. And I was in contact with a station over in Western Australia about 2,700 kilometres away. And anyway, I had, um, he could still get me at 500 milliwatts. So um, I thought, well, we'll go low in power and see how low we could go with this. And anyway, we ended up him hearing bits of my transmission down to about 30 milliwatts. This is on 80 metres um, one evening. So um, it's a very, very efficient mode. Um, and another thing, I, I want to run um, run this idea past some of you because I haven't built this my, myself. But one of the things about JS8 call on 80 meters is that its frequency is, um, the dial frequency is 3.578. Um, and then that's with your SSB gear on upper sideband. So the actual transmission takes place um, one and a half kilohertz or so above that. Anyway, what I was thinking, I haven't tried this. I've tried this with Whisper. Um, and had success is if you're to get a 3.58 megahertz crystal um it's actually 3.57945 now you could probably swing it down 1500 hertz um it is quite difficult to swing 3.5 meg crystals down but you should still be able to do it if you put enough inductance in series anyway you should be able to get that down to 3.578 and if you're to build a direct conversion receiver crystal controlled based on that, then you might just be able to set up so it can work on the JS8 call frequency. Um, just a stroke of luck, serendipity of, of having the right crystal or a common crystal and it happen, happening to be on a, a useful frequency. So um, you could try a direct conversion receiver first of all. I believe there is a RSGB uh, project just recently. Um, I think it was the RSGB Centenary. And the design, the designer of that receiver on 20 metres might even be in the room. And uh, anyway, Steve, um, I did read your article. Um, anyway, the idea was a receiver on 14070 that would receive uh, PSK31 communication. Anyway, potentially you could, um, you could have a similar principle receiving um js8 and if you were to add a few extra stages and make it effectively a double sideband transmitter you might be able to have a transceiver i haven't built it i'm just throwing that idea out there something for you to think about um uh, when, when you get home and start building um as far as some um, other qrp gear um goes um I'll show you this little thing. Um, this is a very small transceiver, um, direct conversion. It's about 300 milliwatts output. Uh, you might be able to see it, but the Morse key is built on the front panel. It's just made out of a bit of springy brass strip and printed circuit board material. 
the whole thing fits in a little food container and it's just a direct conversion transceiver for 40 meters um the other thing is i'll just move it around there you can see the two crystals both of them are on 7030 um and the two crystals in parallel form a super vxo and the benefit of that is you get a much bigger pulling range um in fact this goes down to i think about 7005 so you're getting 25 kilohertz shift um, um it's very crude the transmit receive function is manual a manual switch there's no frequency offset that's automatic so when you go from transmit to receive you have to move it a little bit um and it's just powered by a pack of four AA batteries so that's a, a very simple um a qrp rig um I wouldn't recommend it as a first QRP rig. Um, in fact, I might as well talk about when you're looking at designing or building a QRP rig, there's a few principles that are really important. Um, um, there's, it's one thing to build up a QRP rig, something like a, a Pixie or something, you can buy off eBay very cheaply. Um, if you're fairly experienced, if you've got a, got a good antenna, you might be able to get contacts with it. But generally speaking, um, the very simple projects aren't the same projects that maximize your chance of success. So um, it's one thing to get something, a cheap kit for soldering practice, another to get it on the air and to make routine contacts. So there's a few things that I want to suggest that's really important. Um, first of all is sufficient power output. Um, a few hundred milliwatts is fine. It can span quite long distances if conditions are good, but particularly with compromised antennas, you want something at least one or two watts output. Um, that's one principle. You need a decent receiver. You want to be able to separate stations coming back to you rather than the station that's coming back to you um, being swamped by other signals. That means a receiver with a reasonably strong front end and it's got a bit of audio selectivity so that you don't have a 10 or more kilohertz wide bandwidth. Um, okay, you might be able to get away with it 80 metres during the middle of the day, but on a band like 40 metres, at night, um, you, you need a, a decent receiver. Um, another thing that I think is really important, um, I cannot stress this enough, frequency agility is king. I would rather be frequency agile with five watts than be stuck on one frequency with 50 or 100 watts. Um, I cannot over uh, overstress this too much because with QRP, Often you are having to make contacts by finding other people on their frequency, like uh, tail ending contacts about to finish, responding to other people's CQ calls. Those techniques of making contact require you to be on the other guy's frequency. If you're crystal controlled, then you don't have those options of getting contacts easily available. You're, you just have to hope that there's no one else on your crystal's frequency and um, that there are people that will tune around with low enough noise level that they'll come back to your weak QRP signal when you're calling CQ. Um, so yeah, definitely still worthwhile calling CQ with QRP, but uh, um, you'll lessen the chance of contacts if you are crystal controlled, especially if there's other stations near your frequency that you don't have much control over. So just to repeat, if you want to build a QRP rig to make contacts, frequency agility is king. And I talk about ways of making QRP contacts in my book, Minimum QRP. It's, it's quite detailed in the operating techniques to uh, have success, even with low power. Even at this time of the solar cycle, people say, oh, there's no one on the band. There's no activity. I can't hear anyone. No one will reply to me. Um, there's a lot of different operating techniques. Have a look at the book and... Uh, and, and you should still be able to make contacts. Like if we can do it here in Australia with much less um, population density than you guys in, in Europe, then you, know, you should be able to make contacts, um, even with QRP. Um, and there's so many different modes and things you can try as well. Um, the, um, so that's um, a quick look at some of the construction thing. Oh no, there is one more thing. This little antenna coupler. Um, I'm, I do use in-fed wire antennas quite a lot, mainly because they only need a single support. You can just have a, a fishing pole. Um, I, well, I often, I live right by the beach and down there there's not many tall trees. So 
um, you can, um, um, so it's good to carry your own support and it's easier if you have only one support rather than um, two supports. So an NFED wire half wavelength long is my most commonly used antenna of choice. Um, half wavelength on 40 meters, but then you sometimes might want to operate on other bands, in which case I prefer having a small L-match antenna coupler. I know that some people have fixed um, ferrite transformers, those sorts of things, but I, I just like the assurance of tuning around for a peak in the noise and uh, lowest um, SWR with a um, um, little L-match antenna coupler. Um, this is one that I described um, in a video, so there's details in, in the video for it. Um, and I was, I was actually out yesterday, I was doing a demonstration at Radio Club and I noticed on 40 metres, things were a little bit intermittent with it. Um, then I tried again today, um, and again, on 40 metres, things were intermittent. And so I um, had a look just a, uh, uh, an hour or so, a um, couple of hours ago, and had a look inside and realised that I had used RF chokes for the coils, inductors, which are fine. The inductance with this um, is a choice of three inductors um, and the variable capacitor is just a little plastic type variable capacitor, maximum of a couple of hundred picofarad. Anyway, I was going through um, the switch, by the way, is an unusual switch. It looks just like a toggle switch, but it's got a center off position. That's a bit more expensive than normal switches, but it gives you three inductance levels, um, which for a small antenna coupler, um, it's better to have more, but you can get by with three if you're building a little coupler that goes from seven to 28 megahertz. And the inductance values, by the way, um, are one micro Henry. Um, then I have um, another RF choke, which is 2.2 micro Henry. When they're connected in series, that gives you three micro Henry total. So that's the middle position. And then there's another inductor, 4.7 micro Henry, and that gives you a total um, of around eight micro -henries. So you've got a choice of one, eight, and three micro -henries. And the switch is set up so that um, when it's in the center position, it's neutral and the contacts aren't in contact with anything. Um, and that means all your inductors are in series. So you've got your one plus three plus, not one plus two plus 4.7, gives you around eight micro -henry, which is fine for 40 meters. Then one, the switch one position, you're shorting one of the inductors, then the other position you're shorting two of the inductors so that's how i get a inductance range without a rotary switch so it's nice and small and light anyway i found i was having intermittent problems on 40 meters so i opened the thing up and found that i um it was a bit hard because when i tested it with a multimeter it it seemed to be okay i hadn't blown the inductor but then i measured it um with a little inductance meter um it's a really handy little device. Um, it came from Soda Beams. I did a review on a uh, YouTube channel. Anyway, um, I measured the inductance and it turned out to be about three and a half micro Henry rather than 4.7. And the others measured fine. So anyway, I uh, um, had a look at as well and it seemed to be half burnt, even though it was a short circuit. Uh, it was uh, okay on the model meter. And anyway, I've replaced it now. So yeah, um, one thing with small RF chokes in antenna couplers like this, they can work fine. I think my problem was I was using it on a high duty cycle mode. Like I've been recently doing some slow scan television and uh, whisper and whisper at two minutes ago can uh, um, put a bit of stress on small inductors. So uh, that's just something to bear in mind with some of the QRP antenna couplers. Um, uh, the high duty cycle of some of the digital modes can be taxing. So yeah, that's just uh, um, little thing you know, I thought there. Um, so um, the, um, uh, that's, that's a few of the QRP projects. Um, now, I believe a few people wanted to um, um, wanted me to talk about magnetic loops, so I'll do so. Uh, in the background, um, just here, but before that, I just, um, just found this thing. I was looking for this um, before. This is my first homebrew whisper transmitter. Um, it's 30 meters, so it uses a crystal for 10.140 megahertz. Um, I think it's just a transmitter. Yes, it is, but anyway, it's it's got a um, just a simple crystal oscillator with a trimmer because you've got to get it exactly on frequency for whisper. 
then it goes through a two diode balance modulator and then a couple of transistors. So I think it might only be one transistor. It's probably only about 10 milliwatts or 30 milliwatts, something like that. Anyway, this is a very simple whisper transmitter that can be received over thousands of kilometers or more. Um, and it's this is the antenna socket of the NC and it's powered by the USB connection on, on your computer. So it just runs off five volts. And here's the connection for the sound card output. So something like this could potentially be used with a you know, 3.58 megahertz crystal as well for um, a JSA call. Anyway, getting back to magnetic loops, um, this one is what I call the summer loop. Now, um, this, if you have a look at the variable capacitor, there's this big thing on it. And the reason for that is normally I, I don't use this big trimmer capacitor on it. Usually I've just got a beehive trimmer. It comes from old VHF radios. It goes up to 50 picofarad. So um, the thing I like about these ones, it's got a nice metal thread, which gives you a bit of a vernier action. As for the dimensions of the loop, this is one meter of aluminium. You should be able to get it from a hardware store. It's about 25, 30 millimeters thick. And the feed arrangement for the loop, it's a little bit crude, but it's it's basically like a gamma match. Um, it's just um, the braid of your coax feed line goes to the center directly below the variable capacitor. And then um, the middle of the coax goes about 10 centimeters along uh, just tapped off you might um, you've got a whole, a whole there I tried different settings of it but once you get a, a position that should work on all the frequencies the loop covers um, you could use a smaller loop inside um, that will should also work fine but anyway this loop is really light um, I use kitchen chopping board a really useful material for um, operate um, for QRP experimenting and antennas it's really strong for antenna center insulators and all that sort of thing. Anyway, I use it on, on the top of this loop. And so I've got some wooden doweling going through, making it quite physically robust. So I hold on to this. I have my FT817 in a little bag, and this loop will work between 21 and 50 megahertz. So for the summer sporadic E season, it's a fantastic light antenna. I've had contacts up to thousands of kilometers away on um, uh, during the summer sporadic E. During the last summer um, solar high, there is one opening where I worked about five or six skies in, in Europe, um, all around Finland or somewhere like that. I, I made a video of this, all with five watts walking around pedestrian mobile. And um, in case you're wondering about what the top of this was, um, I've put a extra variable capacitor on top, a trimmer, it goes quite high up to maybe 500 or 1,000 picofarad. You know, this can make the loop resonate down on 7 or 10 megahertz. You wouldn't have an SSB contact down there. It's inefficient. But I was doing some experiments with Whisper. Um, um, and I have done experiments with Whisper transmitting with little loops inside a bus. And believe it or not, that can work. Even though a bus is an RF hostile environment, I have transmitted and received Whisper signals on HF running about five watts on seven megahertz with a magnetic loop inside a bus. Um, I've got a video on that. All right, that's my small loop, the summer loop. Great fun during the warm time of the year. Um, and we'll have a look now at my bigger loop. Um, this one, now I like using banana, um, banana connections here. This is a, a band module. By itself, the loop will operate between 14 and 28 megahertz. It uses three meters of, again, the same material as before, flat aluminium. Um, it's nice and robust. And the capacitor here, I think it's got a maximum of about 100 or 150 picofarad. And um, that works fine for 14 through to 28 megahertz. But if I want seven megahertz, I need to add an extra um, capacitor here. So I've just got some banana, um, banana sockets in here and I happen to be using the screws here I'm using I think are about four millimeters diameter so it happens to be the right size for um, to go into banana sockets so that just fits on quite snugly 
just using a mica capacitor here. I think it's about 150 picofarad. So with this loop, this will work for um, um, uh, um, on all bands from 40 through to um, 10 meters, although you will need an extra capacitor for 40 and uh, 30 meters. Um, and down the bottom, um, again, it's a similar arrangement to what I'm using on the other loop, like a, a gamma match style setup. Um, and again, using nine millimeter timber dowling. So this loop, I think it's it's at least comparable to the um, um, the Alex loop, but it's a lot cheaper. You can build it yourself; it doesn't take very long. You can get most of the parts from hardware stores for it. So um, I, I highly recommend it. I've had some good contacts on forty meters, even forty meters, where the loop isn't so efficient, but it's. Um, I've had contacts into New Zealand, about 2,600 kilometres away, five watts SSB with this loop pedestrian mobile. Um, now, I, uh, as you might have, you might have seen some of my videos. I, I do quite a lot of um, pedestrian mobile. Not so much over the last couple of months as we've just gone through winter, but um, first day of spring, and, I'll, um, and and the weather will be getting better soon. So, um, yeah, either I use a magnetic loop, or more often a vertical antenna or pedestrian mobile. Um, I haven't got it uh, uh, quite uh, with me, but it's basically a five meter long squid pole. So it's a quarter wavelength vertical on 14 megahertz. And the uh, um, I've got a little L match antenna coupler at the bottom, and that works. Um, it works quite well. I've, again, I've had DX contacts in, into Europe. Most of the time, pedestrian mobile is good easy for single hop contacts, multi-hop contacts at this phase of the cycle are difficult but not unknown. But anyway, if you've just got five metres of wire and a telescoping pole, you put that in your backpack, a small L-match antenna coupler, you can match on frequencies between 10 and 50 megahertz quite easily. Um, five metres is, I think it's about 3 sixteenths of a wavelength on 10 megahertz, that's okay. Uh, it's difficult to match a five meter long vertical wire on seven megahertz because it's only one eight one eighth of a wavelength um, long. Sorry, not five sixteenth, three sixteenths of a wavelength. Yeah, um, five meters versus thirty meters. Yeah, five sixteenth. Um, but on seven megahertz, it's only um, one eighth of a wavelength, and it's not very inefficient. Not very efficient unless you add a loading coil in the middle which I've done, and I've just got to switch across that lighting coil so you can switch it in for 7 megahertz or the other bands. And despite that effort, 7 megahertz is really a really good band to have on a pedestrian mobile antenna. There's a lot of times when the higher bands are, are either not open or 20 meters tends to be a more competitive culture. Many of the stations on it are working DX stations, so I find there's a lot of, I have a lot of success in fact, more success on 40 metres than on 20 metres, even with antennas that are nominally more efficient. And that's also something to think about when you're building a QRP rig. Uh, choose the, the right band, as well as being frequency agile. Band like 40 metres is good. 80 metres is, is OK. Um, 20 metres is, is a, can be a bit tough um, in getting contacts. Um, if When you can, you can probably work DX more easily than on 40 metres. Um, but there's a lot of times when um, you know there's more of a local activity on 40 and 80 metres, and it's more convivial, at least here in Australia. Whereas 20 metres is more competitive, people working the other side of the world, and not so much local communication or local nets and skids. So um, yeah, 40 is probably a great band um, to do QRP. Um, also during the summer months, 10 and 6 metres are great because of uh, sporadic heat. Even 630 metres can be surprisingly good. Even if you you think you've only got antennas big enough for 40 metres or um, 80 metres, you can load them up against ground and despite the poor efficiency, with modes like Whisper, you can do quite well on the on the lower bands. Um, okay. Um, the, uh, um, I've spoken about... Oh, I'll have a quick look for questions or... Um, we've got quite a bit of time left. I'll look online and see if there are any questions um, that are worth looking at. Um, okay, well, quite a few, which is fantastic. Um, 
Oh, that's right. I think that I've been fairly busy with. I haven't been um, doing as much experimenting as I'd like lately. I've been fairly busy with writing a, a new book, um, maybe not so much of interest for people in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's the Australian Ham Radio Handbook. So that has only just come out in the last week or so, uh, an e-book as well as um, paperback. Um, that's about 140 pages for Australian viewers. It's definitely worth um, getting it. Um, it goes into stuff that the foundation license manual doesn't and, and also the more operational stuff of operating an amateur station, where to get information, all the different bands and modes and what you can do on the different frequencies. All these things are covered in a bit more detail than, than you get in the um, um, normal theory books, which you should also get. But um, this handbook, I think, is uh, our own Australian handbook. Anyway, um, let's, let's go back to questions. Um, do I sometimes, um, uh, from, uh, uh, do I sometimes do live? Yes, I do. I occasionally operate live. Um, and uh, Steve, um, good to know that the original centenary receiver on 80 meters worked. Uh, would I publish the circuit of the mini transceiver from G4 KDX? I think you mean that little 80 meter CW rig. Um, yeah, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I, I think I might have, there might have been an article in Sprat for failing that there is the circuit in the video I did of it. Um, and uh, Steve, glad you've got copies of the book. Uh, Marcus, what do you think of using double sideband for digital? Um, um, yep, yeah, no problems. Um, of course, you do have to think about the opposite sideband and there is a potential risk of you causing interference to other digital activity on the other side of your crystal frequency. But apart from, you know, provide you're mindful of that, then um, um, yet yeah, no reason why you can't use double sideband. Um, so um, the uh, um, so that's I don't think I've missed any questions. Um, and uh, um, but we do have plenty of time. I'll just have a look around this cluttered room to see if there are um, other topics we could uh, always reach for a. Uh, uh, okay, here we are. Um, yeah, we've, we certainly haven't got a shortage. Well. Um, here we are, HF antennas for all locations. If you're operating QRP portable, um, this Les Moxon book is definitely worth getting. A um, lot of different antennas and ideas you can get from that. Um, I think he has also done work operating portable, um, transmitting from where the water is, is favoring you or where the ground's sloping towards your location. So that's a book I can recommend. Um, if you've got some uh, another antenna book, low band DXing. Now, this is more if you've got a um, lot of land, it's more, you know, it's, it's a good book, a lot of ideas for 160, 80, and 40 meter antennas, but it more suits someone who's got a big budget, lots of land, you know, a few acres of land. Um, but there are still some ideas, so um, it's worth getting this book as well. Um, and more for the home brewing uh, thing, um, anything by Pat Hawker, G3VA. Um, maybe some of the things are a bit dated, but technical topics, scrapbook is a book that I can recommend and you'll be leafing through, um, um, you'll be leafing through uh, bits and pieces. Now this box here, um, I went through a stage a while ago of building these little, things are just covered in so much dust as I haven't uh, fiddled around with them. Of building things on little modules, uh, one of the circuit construction techniques I use is, um, I think it's called paddy board. Anyway, um, blowing out all the dust. Um, it's just a piece of single-sided printed circuit board material, and you just use a hacksaw and cut squares of about five millimeters. And this particular device here, um, amongst all the dust, is a balance modulator. Um, very simple module. You can use it either in a direct conversion receiver or in a double sideband transmitter. And that could be double sideband voice or it could be double sideband um, in the digital modes like we've discussed. So you could have um, some of these modules, you can use them for so many different things. You could even use it as a mixer potentially to frequency converter. Um, we'll have a look at um, these. Are, you, you get an idea when you construct things 
of basic building blocks. Now, this also has a lot of dust, but um, this is a free section low pass filter. I'm a great fan of using RF chokes because they are pre round coils. Um, maybe they haven't got as much Q as an iron powered toy, but um, as a rough rule of thumb, um, if you're building something for seven megahertz, then 4.7 microhenry and 100 picofarad will resonate on seven megahertz. So you can use that as the front end of your direct conversion receiver on seven megahertz. And for three and a half megahertz, then you just need to remember that you double the inductance, double the capacitance. So in this case, 10 microhenry, which you can also buy as an RF choke, and 200 picofarad will work on 80 meters. Um, or it might be 180 picofarad, depending on which part of 80 meters. And uh, if you want to go up for 20 meters, then you could use 2.2 um, microhenry and then 47 picofarad should get you resonance on 20 meters. Um, we'll have a look through this box. Um, and, oh, this is another balance. Oh, this is called 90 degrees, 90 degrees. And it is a very simple, very simple RF phase shift network. Um, this thing, you probably can't see it all that well in the camera, but all it is is a couple of potentiometers and a capacitor. And what else is there in there? Um, no, I think that's about it. But this thing, um, not much in it, but this can convert, uh, can give your RF signal a 90 degree phase shift. So if you're building phasing type single sideband equipment, um, single signal direct conversion receiver without um, having frequency conversion, then a 90 degree phase shift, RF phase shift unit can be uh, um, an advantage. This thing here, I think it's the front end of a um, phasing receiver. In fact, it looks like it. You can see the symmetrical circuit, the uh, two potentiometers that you adjusted and then you had your two outputs, your I and Q, and then you fed those into your audio amplifier. Um, here, um, oh, this is this is part of a low pass filter. Um, again, using RF chokes, as I mentioned before, with my little accident I had with digital modes, um, you can, you know, five watts is about the upper power limit, and you wouldn't necessarily want to run five watts with high duty cycle modes with little RF chokes. But this is a little, um, this thing here is a little low pass filter. I believe there are some uh, circuits. I think George Dobbs might have had an article in Sprat talking about um, low uh, values for low pass filters. So have a look at that and build up some low pass filters on different bands so that when you've got a, a simple transmitter, you can just um, put your um, transmitter onto it and, and be assured of, of a clean output. This thing here is just a little one transistor module. I think an audio amplifier could be a, a micro amplifier. So yeah, um, good idea to have different little modules and things um, so that when you see a new project, you can uh, build, put it in as building blocks and um, I'll be able to build something really quickly. Um, okay, we'll now see if there are any more questions. Um, Uh, okay. No questions in the lecture room. Okay, but there are some online. My phase shift SSV. Okay, Mark Sheldon, whereabouts in Australia am I? I am in. In for people in the lecture room, um, this is going to air publicly on YouTube. So there's a few questions coming from those not in the room. Uh, I'm I'm in Melbourne, about thirty kilometres south of the uh, south of the city. Um, uh, right by the beach, so operating portable. Um, okay, and uh, thanks for uh, uh, having me, Steve. And uh, it's now nine o'clock, so that's the end of the time. I will keep this video going live. So for those watching live, then you can uh, um, ask me questions later on. But um, we say good afternoon to those at the GQRP Club Convention. Thanks for having me on. Thanks to Steve for organising this and uh, hope that you enjoy all the other speakers and, uh, and start building and experimenting and operating.
Okay, well, this is the uh, end of the, um, so I've just finished with the GQRP club presentation. Uh, now, we're, as we're still on, uh, we'll go to a Ask Me Anything. I'm Peter VK3YE and I'll stick around for a few minutes um, where you can ask me on anything on any topic with the, on amateur radio pretty much and I'll try and answer and tell you if I can. Can't. And uh, hello to Mike who's watching. Okay, now there is a question I didn't um, answer before. How many acres of land do I need to have a proper 160 meter band antenna? Um, well, full size dipole on 160 meters is 80 meters long. So um, even if you had maybe half an acre, depends on, on the length of your, your size of your land, um, like an inverted V, you could save a bit of space by having it as an inverted V. Um, in which case, instead of being 80 metres along the ground, you might be able to get away with having only 60 metres along the ground. Um, another thing you could do is you could make the antenna a little bit shorter than the full size dipole. So instead of being 80 metres from end to end, it could be, say, 60 metres from end to end. And you could still bend that down, so you might need only 50 metres of ground space. Um, but even so, you have to think about what you want to make contact with on 160 metres and whether a half wave dipole is the best antenna for you, as it might not be. Um, you are very unlikely to be able to get a half wave dipole at a decent height on 160 metres. Um, like a half wavelength height on 160 metres is 80 metres tall. So if you had two 80 metre tall towers, which hardly anyone does, but if you did, then that half wave dipole would be quite a good DX performer. However, if your dipole is much lower than that, then it won't be so good. Um, there'll, there'll be certain distances, intermediate distances that will cover quite well. Um, like say 100, 200, 300 kilometers. These are the distances where you've got a high angle of radiation, um, your short skip stuff, bouncing one hop off the ionosphere at high angles. Then a low dipole, for those sorts of contacts on 160 metres would be fine. However, there's two types of contacts on 160 that a dipole, unless it's very high, is not going to be any good at. Um, first of all, DX contacts, they need to be low angle of radiation. Um, and then there are ground wave contacts. 160 metres um, has some ground wave coverage that's better than on 80 or 40 metres. Um, it might go out to say 100 kilometres. If, if you want to talk to stations in your city, town, um, closer in, up to 100 kilometres, then you want a vertical antenna on 160 metres. Um, that's what all the broadcast stations use. They are interested in local ground wave coverage on 160 metres. So, um, and for that, vertical antenna is far better than horizontal dipole. And it's also potentially good for DX. Um, so, Having a vertical antenna really reduces the amount of land that you need uh, for 160 meter antenna. Problem is though, a full size vertical antenna on 160, a quarter wavelength is 40 meters long. So you are going to, um, that, that's again going to be difficult for most people unless you've got really tall towers. You can economize on its size by, um, you could have uh, put a loading coil in it. So your you know, antenna height might only be 20 meters tall or even only 10 meters tall yes you can build an effective 160 meter antenna vertical antenna that's only 10 meters tall if you've got a loading coil it can also help if you have a bit of top loading um like a capacitance hat or something like that or it could even be two wires as part of an antenna for another band like some people use dipoles on 80 or 40 meters to operate on 160 they tie the feed line together and have the flat top operating as a capacitance hat and do the radiating from the vertical um, feed line part. Um, that's okay. You need to think about ground systems, radials. Um, it's probably better if you came to have elevated radials, particularly if you're not going to put up 
too many. Or if you've got a large shed, maybe and a metal roof, maybe you can use that. Um, the, the radials might be more of an effort than the antenna system for verticals, but they do affect its efficiency. So um, short answers, I, I'm, I'm in a, a small amount of land here. Um, and the main strip of land near me is, you know, that, that, that I have is 20 metres long and three or four metres wide. Um, and I can get on 160 metres from here. Um, you know, not a particularly strong signal, but uh, you know, I've had contacts, you know, up to several hundred kilometres on 160. So, yeah, you can economise on economise on antennas on 160 and uh, and still get out okay. Um, but it's it's hard. But for your real DX stuff, your grey line stuff, and it's harder. And hello to uh, Leon and uh, um, and uh, trust all that is well with you. Did I get into data broadcasting, uh, open network, called a mesh? Uh, heard of it? Not haven't haven't done anything with that at all. Um, been uh, fairly busy with the other other things. Um, I'm thinking of 160 meter loop. Um, well, horizontal loop or vertical? Um, yeah, yeah, it, it might be quite good for triangle stuff. I'm not sure how it would go for the um, triangle. Um, you could always try um, if you've got you know, eight magnetic loops. I've had contacts on 160 meters with small magnetic loops, only you know this high. Um, so it's again might only be one percent efficient, but you can um, still get contacts. Um, okay, if you've just tuned in, um, I've just finished a session with the GQRP Club presenting on aspects of QRP in Australia. Um, but um, you can now ask me anything. And uh, Paul, um, yeah, well, fortunately, we'll, we'll, we'll save this video um, and, uh, and uh, you can ask me any, any questions later on. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Mark. I'm uh, glad that you enjoyed the talk. Um, and for the viewers in Australia, um, I've come out just recently a new book called Amateur Radio no, it's not. It's not called that at all. It's called the Australian Ham Radio Handbook. Um, Australian Ham Radio Handbook. You can get it on Amazon. Just search in the title. It's pretty much what the Foundation Licence Manual doesn't cover. It goes into a lot more detail. So if you're starting out in amateur radio, especially in Australia, then it's a fairly detailed book. There's about 140 pages, um, close to 40,000 words. Um, and it goes into a lot of things that either the foundation manual doesn't cover and also things that the theory books don't cover. Um, so it's not a theoretical book, it's a practical book on getting the most from amateur radio, particularly in Australia. So it goes into the various bands and frequencies, what they're good for, the um, different modes you can use, operating technique, getting contacts, finding out information, quite a lot more. So yeah. That's the, um, uh, I'm very fortunate and want to thank Dick Smith, VK2DIK, for writing the um, forward for that book. Um, so, yeah, the Australian Ham Radio Handbook, um, available as an ebook, or if you get it from Amazon in the US or in Europe, um, paperback as well. Um, I'd like for that to be available through Amazon in Australia as well, but unfortunately, um, they, don't, they only seem to do ebooks. Um, okay, you can ask me anything, and I'm Peter VK3YE. Uh, all right, uh, things seem to have dried up, so I will stick around for a minute or so and uh, might wrap it up. Oh, when building a wire dipole, do I need a, di um, a ballon? Um, yeah, sorry, that was a question I, I missed before. Um, short answer is no. Um, long answer is a lot of people like to put in ballons. Um, they want to uh, keep the current off the feed line. Um, for QRP work, probably, you know, I've, I've got a way with dipoles without ballons and they've been fine, but uh, yeah, um, a, a lot of people like to dot the I's across the T's and do, um, do have balance in the dipoles. Um, 
if you are building something like a beam, then it becomes more important because part of the attraction of the beam is radiating the radiation pattern and uh, light changes as clean as possible. Um, are there any more questions I have missed? Um, I don't think so. Any beach ops planned, Paul? Well, um, Um, well, I, I was down the beach today, actually. Um, I was lucky to get home before the uh, um, storm. Well, it wasn't much of a storm, but the skies were threatening, and we even had about 30 seconds of hail. But, yeah, um, I started off, I read something about us saying there was some sort of activity day for um, Wattle Day or something for um, um, national parks. Anyway, when I got on, I think it was about 2 p.m. or something, 40 metres was dreadful, but yeah, hardly any signals. Um, so I only had one SSB contact um, into VK5, but um, what, what turned out good was, first of all, tried. I had the computer with me. Don't usually take this laptop with me when I go portable. And um, the um, you know, setup, so I thought, oh, I'll transmit some slow scan TV on 20 meters, and there's uh, um, no one around but I was picked up by VK6 POP's web um, slow scan TV cam thing. Um, if you have it for slow scan TV, if you have a look at some um, uh, search VK6 AAL, excuse me, he, he's got a website where it's got various slow scan TV receivers set up around Australia. Um, so if you send a slow scan TV picture, you, you may well see yourself on there. Um, most of them are on 14230. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I was picked up by uh, uh, VK6. Anyway, um, then there's, I went on to, uh, this is a cheating bit, anyway, I went on to Facebook. There's a Australian Slow Scan TV page that I uh, came up and said I'll, I'll be on 7 megahertz. So I was on, on um, went on there and a couple, couple of guys came up. However, they weren't getting much of a, a signal from me at all. So, then one of them was um, VK3 HJV was in Portland, uh, not Portland, Oregon, but Portland, Victoria, and uh, <clears throat> that's about 450 kilometres. And now um, I'd say I had a pretty good path over to him as um, as it was just across the water, at least some of the way. Anyway, um, went down to 80 metres, and and I, I got a good picture from him. Um, then this is about 2:30 or so, or three in, in the afternoon. Um, and I wasn't, I hadn't planned to do anything for 80 metres, so I hadn't bought a proper antenna. I was just using 20 metres of wire, no no ground or anything. And I had the antenna coupler that had problems, as I mentioned earlier, which I think I've now fixed. But anyway, I, I managed to send, send a picture to, to him and uh, and it was grainy, but yep, I could read my call sign. So that was five watts of, sl of slow scan television. Um, and also... Um, transmitted a couple of bursts of whisper on 20 metres and uh, 30 metres. And if you bring up the whisper website, I know a couple of spots in North America, I think, and Japan. So, yeah, um, only one real SSB contact. But, yeah, did some uh, uh, use, um, some good slow scan TV experiments. And it's uh, good that there's uh, slow scan activity here in Australia. Um, so, uh, so that was definitely worthwhile. Now, there's a question before um, of about the Garan transceiver. Just one moment. Um, now, the Garan transceiver, um, it was a CW rig, features on my website. It was one of my earlier CW-only direct conversion transceivers. Um, originally built it for 40 metres, um, so I, I tried various configurations. I first of all built it um, when I was um, in Western Australia. Um, then when I was in Canberra, I rebuilt it, and I had that going for a while. Then later on, I decided to convert it to 80 meters, and hence we now have the Garin 2. Now the Garen is a VXO transceiver for 40 metres. I think it covered a 10 or 15 kilohertz range. Um, anyway, on 80 metres, because the VXOs don't cover as much, 
Um, I'm not sure if you can read the frequency display, but I'm using a 3.530 megahertz crystal, and it covers about a three kilohertz range. But one thing I really like about this rig that um, might not be obvious from the dial um, is that I've got variable capacitors, uh, two variable capacitors in it. One, um, and I've got a relay that switches between the variable capacitors. So the relay, um, so on one, I'm using the big variable capacitor for receive tuning, and that's and the relay is switched to this. Then on transmit, I have the um, the relay then flips over to this smaller variable capacitor in here. Um, the idea is that this one adjusts the receive tuning and this one adjusts the transmit frequency. So the idea, so you can independently change your receive frequency and independently change your transmit frequency without adjusting one dial and having the two shift. So I find that's really useful um, because it means that because this is a direct conversion receiver, if you've got interference on one side of a signal, you can uh, just tune to the other side of the signal and you are not changing your transmit frequency. You're leaving that uh, where you need to be. Um, then there's this little button here, which I've called a spot button. That is used in receive mode. If there's a station that's calling CQ, then you press this button and it, it switches the relay so that you've got this variable capacitor is now controlling the receiver, whereas it normally only controls the transmitter. And you adjust it so that it's zero beat. Um, and then that guarantees that you are on the other guy's frequency. So once you've done that, you'll leave that alone and you can tune as you like either side, get whatever tone pitch you want. Um, so, uh, and that and this actually gives me full breaking or, or near enough to full QSK on CW, but it's only over a narrow frequency range, about three kilohertz. But I've had some good contacts on it. Um, I'll sometimes drag it out for the CW um, contest every month for little things that um, fists run. Um, sometimes I have a lot of luck with it. Um, you know, if I, I find a frequency, people I you know, call CQ and people find me. Other times people are scattered around and um, because this is crystal controlled, it's um, I, I don't have so luck. But yeah, so that is what happened to the Garen transceiver. Um, it's now 80 metres CW. Um, let's see if there are any more questions. And uh, um, so, yeah, the answer is, do you still have and use your Garen transceiver? The answer is yes, but it's on 80 metres. Edmund, glad you liked the talk. And uh, and glad that you're interested in construction. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, it's probably never been easier to... Because when I got started in, in radio, like 30 years ago, people were, were talking about all this doom and gloom for construction. Like people were saying that, um, oh, you know, you can no longer get variable capacitors, you can no longer get you know, valves, and you can no longer get this and that. Um, and uh, of course, this was all before eBay and e commerce and uh, much international ordering and all that stuff. So, um, Overall, um, you know, what, what's actually happened has actually been the opposite to what the doom and gloom people 30 or 40 years ago. Components and things have got a lot cheaper. Um, you've got things like, um, because one of the fears back then was that if you couldn't get variable capacitors, then you couldn't make VFOs and you couldn't be frequency agile. But now you've got DDS things, so it's a lot easier to build a stable VFO. And you can connect Arduinos up to them and and program to do other bits and pieces. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, um, yeah, so it functions like a transceiver, a trans receiver. Yes, but I'd still call it a transceiver because a lot of the parts are common to them, like the crystal and crystal oxide is common, um, and other bits and pieces. Um, Chris Baird, council cleanup days. Um, yeah, our council cleanup day is. Normally it happens when daylight savings starts, so I don't know, month or two. Um, and Craig, um, a good that you are viewing, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, this has been a uh, a special session for the GQRP Club, who um, presented this for the uh, the annual convention. 
So uh, good to uh, um, have you watching Craig. And for others who've turned on, this is Ask Me Anything and I'm head of VK3YE. Uh, I'm going to this annoying echo from the laptop. And then a minute or so for extra questions, and then I think we'll call it a night. I've been going for nearly just over an hour. Well, I don't think this is very scintillating viewing, so I think everyone who has wanted to ask a question has. So, um, yeah, um, another thing that reminds me, new ICOM, yes, the ICOM 705. Um, I have mentioned it. Have a look at my blog, the dailyantenna.blogspot. Um, blog post came out today. Talk a little bit about the um, ICOM 705. There's a few links there that if you're interested in, you can get more information on it. So, uh, yeah, um, sort of a, a bit like ICOM's version of the Ellicraft KX3, but um, um, probably a similar price tag. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's too good for me to, um, to uh, for me to, take down to the beach and do all the sort of horrible things I'll do with QRP with. So yeah, I think I think I'll hold on to my FTA17. And with that, um, thanks for uh, watching and uh, have a good evening for those in Australia or afternoon or morning for those elsewhere.